everybody, this is Rustin with Metalholic and the Examiner with us tonight, Steve Zetro Zuza of Hatriot, Dublin Death Patrol, Tenant, and of course Exodus, and like 14 other projects I didn't even mention. How the hell are you yeah, doing? Right. <laughs> How are you guys? I'm great, I'm great. Ready to spew some new metal on uh, the world once again. Absolutely, and I want to talk about that in a few minutes. 2012 was a busy year for you. Full-time job, released the Hatriot demo, recorded uh, the album, which is finished now and ready to come out this week, wrote lyrics with Chuck Billy on the New Testament album, and released the second yeah. Dublin Death Patrol album, among other things. Exactly. You, you. Uh, I just, uh, I guess, I'm running constantly. It's just one of those things. Uh, I just try to keep myself musically busy, but uh, my focus now is the Hatriot Boys, the Hatriot Band, the Hat Riot. Absolutely, and we talked about this uh, last spring when uh, you released right. the demo, but. When we spoke last spring, Alex was your drummer, and you said you didn't know if the band would be the same without him. Fast forward, Alex is gone, and another Sousa son, Nick, has taken his place. What happened with Alex, and did Nick go through the same tryout Cody did? Yeah, well, yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Alex likes to play like a lot of other projects. You know, he's doing, he did a death metal band called Archaic. He's playing in Decrepit Birth, and I couldn't keep him locked down long enough to keep Hatriot rehearsing and writing songs, and especially for a new band. So we came to the agreement that it was probably better that we moved on to try to find another drummer. And I felt the same way. Oh, wow, Alex is just such a monster. How the hell are we going to do this? And, you know, Nick's always played drums forever, and I just never listened to him necessarily, I guess, that close that I thought he could handle it. And so he says, I can do this. I can do this. No, I can do this. So we were like, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, actually, Andy Gallion from Death Angel was very much interested. And so was Pete Bostaff, Paul's brother, very much interested. And uh, Nick, so I can do this. I can do this. So he came into the rehearsal, and he just nailed it. I mean, he just nailed it. And so we practiced with him for like three weeks just to make sure that he was the guy that was going to, be the guy, you know, and he uh, he was picking up the songs, no problem. And as every uh, rehearsal got into it more and more, we felt that man, he's getting better and better and better. And so I was just like, you know, I guess how how much better would that be to have another Susa in the band and be like the freaking Partridge family, you know? So I. You know, all the other guys, it wasn't like just my, she's like, okay, go to your brothers in the band. It's like all the other guys were like, yeah, he can totally hang. I have to watch him in practice and watch him write songs with me and Costa and watch him play live. It's like, wow. I mean, I remember saying that about Alex and I, I have to completely retract that. You know what I mean? It's unbelievable. Nick is a better fit for hatred than Alex is. Alex is a great player, and he's very fast, and he's a very finesse player. But Nick is a straight-up John Bonham, Dave Lombardo bounder. He hits the hell out of his drums, and he hits them hard. And when you watch him live, he's beating the shit out of his drums. So it's like, ah, you know, it, it, it's great. It's like it's almost the gloves fit really well, and now the glove fits even better, you know? So... Uh, like I, like you said, our conversation last year, and it's like um, uh, it's unbelievable. It's night and day, and I love I love both of the boys being in the band, and they live together, so it works out really well. Right, and the fact that they're the rhythm section too, it's just you know, perfect. Well, yeah, I made my own rhythm section. Basically, I, I, I literally, I literally made my own rhythm section. So it's. Uh, and everybody always gives that rap on drummers and bass players, you know? They're always just weirdos and freaks, you know? Well, I made my own, and these two are kind of normal for now. I'm going to try to keep them as straight as I can anyway. Well, when you joined Exodus, you found something of a mad genius in Gary Holt. Do you feel that you've discovered a similar creative genius and partner in Costa V? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, that's like how I compare it to. I don't think... I would have done another band like Hatred had I not run across this kid. Listen to the album. Listen to how he writes. I mean, you know, it's like so Bay Area 
brash, so well schooled, so well. I don't know. His dynamics are tasty. I, I don't know. Everything is it's not, it's not overly. It's everything is just enough, you know. And it's still heavy, and it's still you know technical, and it's still you know uh, still got a melody to it. So I would have to say, yeah, he's Peterson. He's Eric Peterson. He's Gary Holt. Definitely, he's definitely out up there. He can do it, and he's young. He's what I saw in those guys. At that age, because you got to remember, I joined Exodus when I was 22, so Gary was 22. Right. You know, so Costa's 24, you know, and I'm looking at Costa, and I'm listening to the songs that he's coming up with, and I'm like, man, I mean, I can just hear his influence with all the songs that he writes, you know, and it's not overly blatant, but it's pretty blatant, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, but it's good, it works, and it works great. And I think the songs in the album is very, very solid. Hatriot is your band. You could easily have named the band Zetro or something. Was it important for you to make it clear that this is a band and not just a Steve Souza project? Yeah, that's why. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to Udo this band. I didn't want to King Diamond this band. I didn't want to Dio this band. Although I have respect for every one of those guys I just mentioned, and I love them to death. But I didn't want that for this band. I feel that... Um, and not to say like Andy LaRock isn't a great part of King Diamond because he is, you know what I mean? And he, he really writes great rhythms for the King to sing over. And you don't look at it like that, you know, but it's the truth, you know? And so I, I, I love, uh, I think that Hatred had to be a band, you know what I mean? And then and Miguel was a great guitar player and, and we could have easily called it Sousa now too, you know what I right. mean? It's obviously... I mean, there was three Hansons, there's three Susans, you know what I mean? So, and I, I just didn't want to do that. I feel that, I, I think a band name is always cool, you know what I mean? And we are a band. I mean, yeah, so I have some history over these kids, but I'm not just trying to sell myself. Listen to the guitar work on this album. Listen to the drum work and the bass work on this record. I mean, this album is in me. You know, this has got a great highlight of what I do. I must say, oh yeah, if you like what Zet does, you're going to love Heroes of Origin, but if you liked what he did in Legacy or what he did in Exodus, man, this is the album for you because I didn't stray away from the formula too much, you know? I just kept doing what I do, and that's what these group of guys have been able to do that, so it's more hatred than Cetro, if that makes any sense. Absolutely, and I was going to say, I mean, there are three Suzes in the band, but metal, rock and roll is all about the riff, and the two non Suzes are a dynamic guitar Amazing. Duo. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, and and you really get that when you listen to the album. Yes, it's a Steve Sousa album, the voice of thrash metal, but these guys are just awesome together, and Costa's songwriting with what you bring lyrically and melodically and everything is just fantastic. Um, now, you made us wait a year. Heroes of Origin out this week. The full-length debut is here. I'll be the first to admit, it's a blistering beast, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like kissing razors and um, kissing razors. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I listen to the record, and I, again, I've listened to it for four months now, and I'm like, ah, man, we just slice you and dice you from the first song to the end. It just doesn't let up. And I'm objective about it. I can look at the record and go, you know, and you know, yeah, you know, and I don't like to do anything like that musically like that. I want it all to be great. And I think that everything I've put out has been pretty damn good. And this thing, I think this is tops everything that I've done. I think, uh, as they say with wine, you get better with age. But I mean, this band is pretty damn good. You know, in, the, in the famous words of uh, Donald Duck Dunn from the Blues Brothers band, we could turn goat piss into gasoline. Right up. So. <laughs> well, the sense I got listening to the album, the first thing that popped into my mind after I went through through most of it was the album is absolutely relentless. There is no let up in it, and um, and we can talk more about the some of that stuff in a minute. But I wanted to ask you because the song the song title "Heroes of Origin" obviously that's where the name comes from. But w what's the meaning behind it? I think the "Heroes of Origin" is your is your metal anthem uh, that there always has to be on a record from a true metal band as to whereas, you know, uh, again, 
nobody listens to us. We're, we're music that is not played on, on live stream radio. It's not on television. The Grammys don't even play our one award on the live telecast. You know what I mean? Right. You don't get to see it. So the heroes of the origin are the metalheads, are the, are the ones that, that, that cut through all the bureaucracy and all the hypocrisy of all the other craps and, and fight through. And we are the ones that are left because we're true to what we stand for. We are the heroes of origin. That's where all, you know, the heroes of metal, the heroes of origin, what we originate. That's what I am. For 30 years, this is all I know and all I've done. So to me, I'm a hero. I'm the one that brings, like, Dio's a hero, Ozzy's a hero. You know what I mean? They're all heroes of origin. And the Patriot, these are the heroes of origin. The new heroes. Right. And the Patriot name and subsequent imagery with the pentagrams replacing the stars on basically an upside down flag. I know it's all part of the anger sure. fueled presence of the band, sure. but clearly sure. as, and we get that from the lyrics as well. You're not happy with the state of our nation. I'm not happy with a lot of things that they do, but proud to be here. That's what the problem is. It's like the flag is so pretty when they sing the song during the football games and all that stuff like that. But is it really like that? Now, look at the inside of how it really is. The infrastructure is just tore up and messed up in every way, shape, and form from the Second Amendment, which I agree with, but look at Look at the message caused. You know what I mean? It's just everything. And, and them being able to, I, I, the, just the bureaucracy whole part of it, you know, people like you burn the American flag and say, no, I didn't. It's the Patriot flag. If you look, there are pentagrams and they're in the fields of blue with our flag, and it's the way we fly it is we're flying it the way it should be flown, pissed off and ugly, because that's what way the way we look at it. But it's not something we'll delve on for long. In fact, I mean, we have four songs for the next record already. The next record, you probably won't see the flag at all, you know what I mean? It's not, the name will still stay the same. You'll probably continue to see the pentagram and the, and the shield in there. We call it the ball. And the ball, but uh, I, I don't think we'll, you know, the, like the, the the flag is going to be something 10 years down the road, you'll be seeing the flag. I don't think that that's where we're still, we'll move on, definitely. Uh, hell, at the rate we're going, we may not have a flag for our country, but, and you look at the economy, the gun control bullshit, Obamacare, lyrically speaking anyway, and far, as far as topics go, this could have been a double album to begin with. Oh, can, I, can, I can go for days, believe me. <laughs> believe me and I try not to keep everything um, politically and socially um, because I, I try to have fun songs from the shadows of the buried obviously as vampires and and um, uh, uh, dark passenger is about Dexter so I have fun on the record as well but there are social things and big things that piss me off and when it does I sing about it you know so and that you know, exactly and, and I think that when I'm asked well what's your definition of hatred and my definition is well, a hatred is somebody who loves his country, but doesn't necessarily deal with, uh, agree with the hypocrisies and the things and the decisions that go on. And, and we have no control over that. We just kind of have to sit there and take it. You know what I mean? It's like, and you're against it, but there's nothing you can do about it. But it's like, well, does that make you unpatriotic? Well, no, it just kind of makes me a hatred, you know what I mean, basically. I'm not a patriot, I'm a hatred. I pissed at the way you're doing shit, you know? And there's nothing I can do about it. That's kind of where that comes from, I guess. And there's a lot of that going on right now. I've talked to a lot of I've talked to a lot of people about this lately, many among our metal brethren, if you will, and there is a sense that in America, as we know it right now, growing up the way you and I did that in many ways we're sort of at the end of days waiting for the reset to happen, be that Armageddon, Civil War, what have you. Do you think I'm it's reaching that you, point, or are you more optimistic well, I, about it? I, I, I try to stay optimistic about it. I, I, I just think that um, as society gets more and more violent, as the music got more violent, society gets more violent, and it just gets more and more. And the things that we used to, I remember watching Good Times. Remember Good Times? It was in the oh, 70s. Yeah. It was a show. Oh, yeah. yeah, Good Times, Good Times, you know, Good Times. <laughs> and I remember they were like a poor family that lived in the projects, and they used to talk about mugging and, and crime in the street and inflation and how much time. And to listen to that and see how they even complained about those types of things in the 70s, and you felt that that point in time was like, wow, the world is really a mess. You know what I mean? Boy, look at how the world is just turning up with all this crime and stuff. And you fast forward 40 years later, it's like, 
wow, what's it going to be like in 40 more years? Oh, my God. It's just a straight-up mess now. Yeah, what's that? So did you used to do that when you were a kid, the whole Kid Dynamite thing? Of course, loved it, loved it. That was my. <laughs> I, I I stole that line from him too. Hey, I remember. I'm a little white kid who grew up in Dublin, so there was not too many black kids that were going down on mine. So I had that. That was mine. Okay. <laughs> So I want to back up just one second. We were talking about uh, some of the themes and lyrics on the album. What were some of the themes on this album that you tackled lyrically that were gnawing at you? Um, things that gnaw at me. Nothing that really gnawed at me. Just things that I have to, um, I have to say. I, I, I like to write a, like tongue in cheek a lot. So um, I poke at some things. Um, obviously, we live in the United States. You have television, television. They have that channel, the ID Discovery Network, where I call it the Murder Channel. They have a million shows um, that have to do with murder. Anyway, it can be murder, your wife's going to murder somebody, your friend murdered somebody, evil twins murder each other, murder, 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 murder. So a um, murder American style is kind of a, a, a rift on that. It's like, I mean, we've found so many different ways to kill and kill each other that they've dedicated a whole channel and a whole day's worth of shows to it. So it's kind of a stab at that. And then um, there's a little bit more social stuff, obviously. Weapons class destruction is Littleton, Connecticut, but obviously, you know, inspired from Columbine incidents. And um, Grotocidal is um, about being in um, a market in a third world country and having a suicide bomber just come in there and just tear up everything and that hasn't happened over here yet but it's gonna you know so it's just the fear of the things that happen so there are some social um, um things or some personal things a couple of years ago i was at a halloween party and i got in a fight i mean i'm like 46 years old and i'm in a fight at a halloween party so mechanics of annihilation is about the things that are going through my head during that fight and so um and then I write about fun stuff like uh, uh, Anti Children to Be Damned is about the Countess Bathory and the way that she liked to bathe in the blood of virgins because she thought that it would keep her youth. And we're actually doing a video for that song here on March 10th, so which I'm going to tell you is going to be very bloody, and the band and everybody in the video is going to be drenched in fucking blood. That's all I can tell you. Nice. Right now. Got a little bit of the death metal chants going on in there as well. Oh, yeah, exactly. So you've got to remember, my band, the kids, are very much influenced by other stuff. Cody, my son, listens to The Faceless and The Black Dahlia Murder all day long. Right. You know, and Costa loves um, Morbid Angel and Cannibal Corpse and Corpse Grinder and every other kind of crap like that, plus the thrash that I do. So everybody's well-versed in metal. So, you know, they're like, hey, Dad, we're going we're gonna to make a breakdown on this album. And I'm like, oh, really? We're going to have a breakdown? They're like, yeah. So they, that was like conscious that they knew they were, we have to. Well, we're young. We have to have a breakdown. I'm like, all right, I guess so. Just one, though. <laughs> so it's kind of a... <laughs> well, and that's the thing. You've managed, you guys have managed to tap into that classic retro zetro, if you will, feel of the early 80s thrash movement, but because of the youth in the band, and everything, there's still that modern appeal, the modern bits and pieces that add to it, so sure. it doesn't just blast become... Beats. There's blast beats in there through oh, the yeah. whole record. Yeah, so it doesn't become stagnant in any way as just, uh, oh, it's just vintage thrash. Um, you know, it, it's it's definitely modern and current while tapping into, you know, what what you started as one of the forefathers of the thrash legacy, which brings me to one of my questions I'm going to ask you in a minute. I'm going to put it in your head now so you can start thinking about it. I'm going to ask you, being one of the forefathers of Thrash, to give us your five essential seminal Thrash albums. But before that, you left Exodus about a decade ago before the South American leg of the Tempo of the Dam tour because, like the rest sure. of us, you had a day job, a family to support. Hatred right. is just, yeah, Hatred is just planting its flag. How will you work touring into the mix? Uh, actually... At that point, you got to remember, Cody was 12 and Nick was 9. True. Now Cody's 22 and Nick's 19 and they're both in the band. So the commitment to go home, there's no commitment anymore. Unfortunately, you know, their mother and I are no longer married. 
and I, I live with my girlfriend who's very supportive of this, 100% of this, and my job knows where it's at, and I've been in the union for like 20 years now, so it's like time for me to come back. So I'm kind of, hey, to tell everybody this, but I'm going on tour again for the rest of my life, and they can suck a bag of dicks if they don't like it. That's just the way it is. So I'm not going to be to where I was more, ah, oh, well, I've got this career, and i kind of got to take care and raise these kids. I've raised these kids. I raised them right, didn't I? Raised them to play metal, didn't I? So here they are. Here we are. And that's what I'm doing. So if a tour started tomorrow, I'd call my boss up tomorrow morning and go, oh, you better get another foreman to cover my jobs because I'm going on the road. It's really great being here. And thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. I'm not playing around. They were younger then. I felt if I was going to make a commitment as a father, I'm not going to drop out on some 9-year-old and 12-year-old kid and just go start touring the world and being, you know, Johnny Rockstar again. And then I'm like, hey, wait a minute, Dad. You were like here half the fucking time of my life, and now you're going to trip? You know what I mean? It's like, okay, well, now your mother can handle it. I wasn't going to do that. And I felt every time that I was out with Exodus on Tempo of the Dam, that was just a knife in the side of me. I couldn't even comfortably do those tours because of that. I just couldn't. It's like I, I didn't want to be there, but I owed the fans this, and I owed myself this, so I had to be there, but I hated it. You know what I mean? And for some reason, I was like, oh, my God, I'm like this you know, great singer in this killer metal band that everybody loves all around the world, and I'm completely miserable, and I just didn't want to be that way anymore. And so now, you know, doing the Kenneth Project, doing the Devil and Death Patrol Project, you know, I, you know, writing with Chuck back and forth on the Testament stuff, I... I I think mean, this is really where I'm at. This is where I want to be. It's like I'm, I'm back to where I want to be at again. I want to do a record and do a world tour and we'll tour it again. And then if I need to do another record, do it again and keep doing it and just keep doing it again. So in 10 years, you have nine Patriot records and a double live record and live at live record and then the greatest studio hits, Vetro's hits record and I'm still doing this shit. You know what I mean? And my kids have already gone on and and then, you know, got all whacked out on drugs and had to go to rehab and come back in the band and I've had to get replaced with all that kind of fun stuff that you go through as a band, you know? And so I, I need that to happen to me in the next 10 years. And have you already not started lining up? Not necessarily that last stuff, but if it happens, I'll kill them. <laughs> have you started lining up tour dates for 2013 or have we not gotten to that part yet? We have not. We're, we're trying. That's like the next big thing. We're trying to secure a booking agent right now and hook on to something. We feel that the record's very strong and with the support of all the press and everybody. Because actually, since it's re been released uh, on iTunes and Amazon since January 25th, it stayed. it's in the top four in thrash metal and heavy metal. And, uh, and it was actually number one for a couple of days. So it's the MP3 on, and that's great for us. I mean, you know, it's... At debut record, we couldn't ask for anything better, and and um, tomorrow it actually hits the stores. So if we could somehow bust the top 200 with this record, that would be awesome. That would give us a lot of leverage to be able to uh, secure some something really good. And we want to be on the road. We want to be playing every day. Obviously, it has to be feasible to do. Right. You know, we just can't jump in a band and tell everybody to quit their job and go out and then come back home and go, okay, that was great. And, uh, really did nothing for us, but okay. We have to be pretty smart. We've been pretty clever about everything we've done, and we've done everything right. So we're not trying to, okay, we got a record, now we got to run out of tour, and we're going to, ah, I'm jumping the pool that's empty. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to be pretty smart about it. We want to go out with some good dance. We want it to be a good package. So we're on Tuesday night. We know we have to make you forced to come out to see it because it's just something you can't miss. You know, we understand that. So Absolutely. we're looking absolutely and speaking of the fans a moment ago i do have one fan question sent in for you most mem most memorable exodus moment for you most memorable exodus moment for me in 1988 we walked out in, in holland and they didn't do a lot of festivals at this time and again this is in the late 80s right and um there's oh, we go out on stage and we headlined dynamo festival and i think this was one of the first really big crowds, I think, and it was 30,000 that we had lined in front of it. It was pretty big, and I walked out on stage, and before we even cut into the first song, there's like seven pits going. I'm just looking at counting them, and so like, like, we're not even in the first song yet, and there's one, there's another one, there's one. Oh, shit, there's one all the way back there. Well, and there were just seven pits, guys just pitting, different, different place, and um, pretty memorable. And we do have it on that. Uh, 
video, somebody videotaped it and I have it and I watch that from time to time because I'm just like, and I'll show people, I'm like, oh man, you guys are going to screw us, don't look at the crowd, blah, blah, blah. look at my seven bags, you know what I mean, I'm pointing out the crowd, it's funny. <laughs> Now we know where crop circles came from. So, <laughs> all right. So before we get out of here, I told you it was coming. Give us your five yep. essential seminal thrash albums, and yes, Exodus albums do count. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I've got to get two of those because I've got to give my shelf a shot. Bonded by Blood, obviously. Right. That's that's essential. And then Temple of the Damned, yes. South of Heaven, The Legacy, Ride the Lightning. Perfect. Steve Zetro Souza, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. Famous last words on the way out? Keep keep rocking. Keep banging your heads, fellas. And we're going to come slay you on tour. And watch out. It ain't going to be too much longer. You're going to get yet another new Hatred record. You get one tomorrow, probably one in the less than another year. We're working on it right now. Keep banging your head.